That's right, folks. Here it is, the brand new Mantua GP20 from the Mantua Classic line, equipped now with MRC's exciting new technology, Loco Genie. Get one of these units and see why all the model railroad companies and DCC manufacturers are like are now frightened of the new technology that MRC possesses that is guaranteed to blow the doors off of model railroading as we know it. And while that's certainly true about the new Loco Genie technology included in this locomotive, the engine itself is so old that if it were an American citizen, it'd be roughly 10 years away from collecting Social Security. Now, just how did this prehistoric locomotive wind up with such a modern upgrade? Well, let's find out. Back in the 1940s, a man by the name of John Tyler was running a very successful manufacturing company that would eventually become known as Mantua Metal Products. The main reason for the company's massive success was the company's ability to produce very high quality and reliable and smooth running motors. These would prove particularly effective in propelling the locomotive model kits the companies were producing at the time. The company's extensive catalog included everything from slot cars to toy boats and, of course, model trains. Model trains themselves were going through a major period of change, with several veterans returning from World War II with new families to start and requiring housing and quick. The requirement was for houses that were ever smaller. Simply put, O-scale was not going to cut it in these new times. The combination of the noticeable space requirements as well as the lack of detail and the annoying third rail track design really wasn't going to win over anyone that had just seen the real thing. And most veterans had traveled by train during deployment during World War II. HO scale seemed poised to take O scale's place as a dominant model railroad scale. There was just one problem. You see, HO scale at the time was a modeler's scale. It was hard enough to build a locomotive that ran, and if you did get it running, it probably didn't run right. But 9 out of 10 times, it didn't work at all. It was basically designed as a gauge that you would basically build trains for to, for the sake of having models that actually as a bonus ran, not as a gauge that actually would have trains that ran reliably. Mantua, seeing this, began to produce a line of ready-made steam engines that would fill into this gap perfectly. They were die-cast metal fully assembled and required nothing more than to be placed on the track and have the power turned on. This was the start of a revolution that Mantua had jumped on, predating a lot of other manufacturers, including Lionel, who would eventually jump on this market later on. As business grew for the ready-to-run model section of the company, Tyler decided to establish a new company that would also take on a lot of the toys the company manufactured called Tyco, short for the Tyler Manufacturing Company. Essentially, this section of the company would focus on ready-to-run models for the trains, as well as the toys, while Mantua continued to produce the kit versions of these items. Another product line that would be placed under the Tyco name were the ready-to-run train sets. These sets would, of course, continue to feature the famous by this point, Mantua drive system that became an industry standard and was known for its extremely high quality and smooth running and long reliability. It's important to note that most locomotives did not have all-wheel pickup, let alone all-wheel drive at the time. Eventually, Mantua would be merged into Tyco and the company would continue to produce pro product lines. One of the first examples of one of these cross products is this GP20. Again, it features the very much famous and extremely smooth and reliable running and to a drive system. We are now looking at one of those vintage locomotives, this one I acquired from a neighbor more than 20 years ago. Please take note that the unit features metal railings, not plastic, which give away its age. And then if we turn it over, we see that the unit has, under, written underneath it, Mantua Tyco, not Tyco not Tyco itself. This gives away the fact that this locomotive was produced, before, produced during the transition period. Note the gaping pilot holes to accommodate the couplers, which are in fact truck-mounted, giving away the age of this locomotive itself. We also note on the underside that the drivetrain has humps underneath it. This indicates it has the five-pole, smooth-running drive system the Tyler's developed, not the horrific abomination it would eventually inherit down the line. We'll get into that later. When I initially acquired the locomotive, I got a lot of assistance from my father to get it up and running again. Unfortunately, it didn't run very much because I had found Atherin engines and found they were much better runners. So I wasn't expecting this locomotive to run at all, period. However, with a little encouragement... It began to run in quite well, although admittedly not perfectly. This unit would probably need more work if I intended to turn it into a real runner for my layout. Although that probably isn't going to happen, as again, I need DCC, and this sort of conversion is quite extensive and probably not worthy of it. That said, and in sharp contrast, unlike a lifelike locomotive from the 80s, which would have required extensive work to get it to run terribly, this one just started working by itself. It just goes to show you the difference in quality these units were produced with. 
As mesmerizing and enjoyable it is to watch this locomotive move along smoothly, especially after sitting out of commission for so long, we do need to move on with our story. Motorized and electronic toys began to become very popular, one of Tyco's main businesses. But to further expand into these businesses as well as update its train line and all of its other lines of products, the company needed money. Rising fuel and energy prices would also begin to put major strains on small family-run companies like Tyco. This is also the era of the big corporate conglomerate, in other words, a big business that was in several different industries at once. And so, with all this in mind, the Tylers decided to sell the company off to Sarah General Lee Foods Corporation, Lee. better known as... That's do. right, Sara Lee. Cheesecake good enough to be called Sarah Lee. Ooh, cheesecake, sweet, creamy, strawberries, whipped cream... <laughs> Sorry, I'm on a diet, folks, and I've been trying to cut back. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, the, so the company sold itself off to Consolidated Foods at this point, which, of course, became known as Sara Lee, as I just mentioned. And good thing, too, because by this point, they were facing a big challenge coming from Irving Atherin and his Atherin Trains and Miniature Company. The company had begun producing what was called the Blue Box Kits. These locomotives featured all-wheel drive and all-wheel pickup, and best of all, weren't that difficult to work on. And if this wasn't bad enough, they didn't cost much more than what the Tyler company was offering, and they essentially made the Tyler trains look like a bit of a joke. Something clearly had to be done, and so the Tylers approached the General Foods Corporation board, which they were also members of, and asked them if they could get an investment into the company, so they could update the drive system, which had now been officially outdated, to something that would compete aggressively with the Atherin setup, and still be high quality, and still hit the price points they were looking to strike. The response, unfortunately, General Foods gave them was, well, no. The relationship between now Sara Lee and the Tyler family continued to sour, and finally they were booted out of the company by the mid to late 70s. Sara Lee Corporation would cite the unprofitability of the Model Railroad and Toy Division as being the main reason for this, and the Tylers being fully responsible for it. This was despite the fact that the company refused to give them the proper financing to build the type of products they needed to build. Instead, they wanted to cut the overhead. And so General Foods would stick to what it knew and would apply the rules to making their tasty cheesecakes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, they would apply those rules to making cheesecakes more profitable, to making their model train business more profitable. Ironically enough, the company would decide to accomplish this goal. They would, in fact, need a whole new drive system. Unfortunately, it was not one that would compete well with Atherin at all. In fact, it would basically take all the positives with the current Mantua drive developed system, the five-pole motor that was built in a New Jersey manufacturing plant and produced by Craftsman, and basically replace them with cheap labor from Hong Kong and a badly developed drive system that was in every way cheap, cheapened to maximize the profit of the product. The result of this concoction was known as the Power Torque Motor, and yes, it's actually worse than it sounds. Although this didn't stop Tyco from having the nerve to market this as being something special that they had spent years crafting to basically enhance the enjoyment and satisfaction of all their customers, when the opposite was very clearly the case. So what exactly made this drive system so terrible? Well, let's take a look at one up close to see. The motor we see is a three-pole instead of a five-pole, much like a three-cylinder as opposed to a four-cylinder engine. This causes an unusual amount of rough running, especially at lower speeds. The gears were manufactured from very thin and cheap plastic and often weren't properly cut out of the molds, meaning excessive slag would jam the gears as they attempted to operate on the track for the first time. Motor bearings failed, commutators were badly wound, the gears themselves would sometimes shear in half, or the pivot mounts would break off. The list goes on and on and on. And as we see, unfortunately, by this next scene, the GP20 would be treated to the indignity of having one of these drive systems installed on it. As we see, this is essentially a small kid in big sneakers. If we take a look very carefully, the drive is actually set up to be six axles on all these locomotives. To get this locomotive to work as a four axle unit, they simply slip this dummy gear set in the middle that would transfer the power between the two outer wheel sets, allowing the truck to drive as normal, even though there was actually supposed to be a third wheel set in the middle. If we take a look at the shell, it becomes very clear that other than the drive system, Tyco didn't make any changes here, except further cheapening the model, replacing the metal railings with plastic ones, and of course writing Tyco on the fuel tank instead of Tyco Mantua. The end result of all this cost-cutting was that these locomotives developed a terrible and well-deserved mechanical reputation. They would often be broken right out of the box and require major work to get going, or a trip back to the store of purchase to get a new one to replace it. In some cases, one by the time of the special of the late 70s when Bachman was being revamped by Kadar Industries, one could buy a Bachman and get a lifetime limited warranty out of it, a much better investment in my opinion. 
As we see up close, they are in fact the same engine, but we can further see the huge difference in the sizes of the trucks. As we can see very clearly, the six axle sticks out like a sore thumb, especially when it's trying to imitate a four axle truck. Again, this was another cost cutting attempt, so one whole dry system could be used across several models. While this is quite clever, it doesn't really do very much for the engine being realistic. These were actually supposed to be models after all. Anyway, let's see how this thing runs. Now, while admittedly it does run pretty well, I should note full disclosure, this model had actually been completely rebuilt by the previous owner. It was the best example of a GP20 I could get hold of for the price, so that's why I purchased it for this film. I don't have one in operating condition, and all I have are parts. That said, if you'll note, it has excessive commutator whine and a few other weird quirks, and the slowed speed performance has nothing to write home to mom about. And I think if I left this engine running no longer than I'm about to, it probably would break. Tyco would continue to cheapen the product as much as possible at the expense of quality to enhance their profits further. While all of this made its stockholders happy, it did it at the expense of the brand name and the quality control. By this point, it was the late 70s, and the Tyler family has had enough of watching their name get drugged through the mud, and they decided to jump back into the industry. They bought a few of their old locomotive models back from Sara Lee, including the GP20 and F7 units, and would relaunch them sometime in the late 70s under the Mantua brand. They also brought back a good deal of their old steam engine kits from the back in the day. To everyone's surprise, despite having the same prehistoric five-pole drive system, they flew off the shelves. This prompted Mantua to continue expanding its product line for a time. As we can see by the underside of this locomotive, it has the same drive system that went out of production in the 1970s and was created in the 1960s. Note that now the power truck is actually on the rear of the locomotive instead of being on the front. It was discovered from previous experiments and customer feedback that having the power truck on the front of the locomotive would actually cause it to climb the rails, especially in curves, causing the train to come off the tracks. Putting it on the rear stopped all of this. Other than that, there really are no real differences in this locomotive right down to its original brass-style wheels that were still being installed all the way into the 90s. Finally, by the late 90s, the Tylers finally realized they had to do something about the drive system for their diesel locomotives, which could still trace its heritage back to the late 60s. They came out with an all-new all-wheel drive system with a single flywheel to handle the job. By 2000, the drive system was available for purchase in these locomotives, and it only cost a whopping $4 more than the standard one still equipped with the old Mantua drive system. It would eventually become the only way to acquire these locomotives down the line. At first glance, these locomotives look just like the previously editioned models. Nothing was changed on the outside once again. The differences come when we take the shell off. As we can see, it's a pretty basic system. A decent quality motor hooked up to a single flywheel and with two shafts protruding from either end, hooked up to worm gears on either end to gearbox towers, then in turn drive the gears inside the trucks. Somewhat old school, especially with the wheel wipers, but considering how old this locomotive's heritage is, one has to remember. Unfortunately, the company wouldn't live much longer beyond this point. In 2002, citing lack of interest in model railroading and a lack of internal profits to make it worthwhile to continue their line, the Tylers would sell the assets of Mantua off to the Model Power Corporation, which would in turn continue to manufacture their models. Model Power would buy the tooling and continue marketing the steam locomotives largely from the Mantua line, as it already had a good selection of diesel locomotives under its own line, Model Power, to market for itself. The GP20 and F7 would be discontinued through this period, and would not make a reappearance for roughly 10 years. The GP20 would then reappear in 2012 with DCC and Sound, thanks to the company's new partner, MRC, who had recently lost its contract to provide sound-equipped engines for Atherin. Model power was available, and so the two teamed up to produce sound and DCC-equipped engines. I'll get into why that happened later on. Now, some of you might recognize this model as the one I just showed before, and that's because, basically, it was. The company largely took the original model that was out of production for years and literally scotch-taped a DCC and sound decoder onto it, using a cheap harness to basically make all the connections, and Viola, they had a DCC and sound-equipped locomotive. This was essentially a desperate last shot out of the gun for the company to compete. 
To really add insult to injury, Bachman introduced its sound value line of inexpensive sound-equipped locomotives around the same time, in this case with soundtrack sound decoders, as the MRC decoders were never known to be all that reliable, let alone up-to-date, plus much more detailed and up-to-date moddies lacking the annoying massive pilot holes that constantly reminded you that you were running an engine that was prehistoric. Needless to say, these prehistoric locomotives with not-so-reliable and not-so-modern sound-equipped decoders were complete and total flops for model power. This plus the model power metal train line that had failed miserably before and several other business decisions, plus the fact that their banks essentially decided they were tired of essentially lending money to them, pushed the company out of business in 2014. It looked like that was the end of the story for this product line, and you're probably wondering if it is, but no. Surprisingly, at least to some, MRC quickly stepped up and bought Model Power out. Now, one might think that this is a pretty bizarre decision, but it actually makes perfect sense if you think about it. First of all, if we think back to QSI, which was a set, one of the first sound providers introducing products in the mid-2000s, they went out of business shortly after Atlas dropped them as their sound supplier. MRC essentially had the same thing happen to them now with Model Power kaput. The second reason that made, made this made sense was the fact that Model Power most likely was sold for the assets, therefore it was, an expensive t was not an expensive takeover price, and it would make perfect sense for MRC to have a line in-house it could then release its new products on. And then it could release the product that we've been waiting for and about to hear about, the one that was supposed to blow the doors off its competition. That's right, the Loco Genie. I'm sure many of you are by this point are very desperate to know just what Loco Genie is. Well, essentially, it's a way for the locomotive to be operated by a remote control on either DC or DCC track. Unlike the Bachmann systems which use Bluetooth, this particular system relies on a wireless system operating at 2.4 GHz. Another advantage of this system and, a diff and or difference of this system between this and the Bachmann setup is that these particular decoders actually have DCC and sound installed on them from the factory. You can literally take this engine and put it on a DCC layout and get full operational commands of the DCC and sound system. You should also note the sounds do also function via the remote control when the unit is run on DC power. This is to say you can use the remote to ring the bell, blow the horn, etc. Something you can't necessarily do with the Bachmann units while there are sound effects, they're built into the app itself and only emanate from the wireless device you're using to run the locomotive. As we get the locomotive out of the box, we see it's another case of say hello to the new boss, same as the old. The same brass horn, gaping pilot holes are all in eminence. The main difference here, they are equipped with knuckle couplers. I should note that this upgrade originally took place when the Tyler still owned Mantua and before it was sold to Model Power. We also note that the locomotive is using wheel wipers to pick up power, although it's very difficult to see here. While this is in fact an all-wheel pickup system, it is the same system the Tyler family installed during the Mantua days. We also note the unsightly holes below the cab. This, these are for the tabs that actually hold the shell in place on top of the actual chassis, a legacy of the original design that was carried over. Apparently the Tyler's model power and now MRC had neither had either either nor the will and or the money to deal with this unfortunate site. Those familiar with the old Mantua slash Tyco GP20s will be right at home working on this particular model. To get the shell off, we have to separate the tabs from the actual chassis itself. This requires a bit of force and careful work, and I actually had to do this partly off camera because it's so difficult. After a little fiddling and a little force, the two finally separate. And we can see that I wasn't joking, yes, the board is in fact scotch taped right on top of the motor itself. This has got to be one of the worst factory installed DCC and sound systems I have ever seen, if not the worst. As we can see, the locomotive now does have, in fact, a full chassis with a little die-cast metal lining for extra weight. But the fact of the matter is, nothing is going to disguise just how old this model is in general. Again, just a single flywheel and very basic gearboxes to transfer the power. The speaker for the decoder, as we note, is on the bottom of the actual board itself. Another strange point is that the capacitors are literally sitting on top of the motor itself. This is not a, such a good idea in my humble opinion, as they can in fact burst and cause a serious short here. Clearly the labor building these models was not very skilled, and it shows in a lot of other aspects of this engine which we'll get into in just a little bit.
Again, a close-up look at the trucks. They are wheel wiper equipped, not bearing equipped. Not surprising considering all the other shortcuts, but seriously. On the bottom, we have the usual Mantua Made in China logo. And a shot of the other truck as well, again using wheel wipers. And here's a shot of the headlight of the locomotive itself. I never actually did see the rear headlight, which is something I would note would not function when I tested it. Please note this locomotive was disassembled after I tested it. Anyway, let's give this baby a test run. As we see, I'm going to be utilizing the Loco Genie to control the locomotive, and just a standard Bachmann DC power pack for power. Well, let's go ahead and give this thing a try. Bell and horn buttons are very responsive and very easily labeled and easy to identify, although the engine didn't respond well, as we'll see to my accelerating commands. I must also note that the sound effects of this engine are incorrect. The GP20s had a turbocharged 567D prime mover, which has a completely different sound from the standard 567, which is what we are hearing from this current locomotive. As we can see, after a few attempts, the locomotive didn't respond by moving, although we did actually hear the prime mover speed up. It would also not go beyond a certain RPM level, no matter how many times I pressed the button to increase the speed of the locomotive. Strange. Finally, after I touch the four times button, which apparently increases the locomotive's speed by four steps at a time, the locomotive finally began to roll. While the locomotive is certainly a little quieter than the Tyco model, that's not a lot to be said for a locomotive that was supposed to be so refined. It made disturbing whining and grinding noises as I ran around the track. Also note the red light emulating from when I pressed the button here in just a few seconds in front of the camera. It's very strange that a system that was supposed to be based upon a 2.4 GHz wireless radio would have something that appears to be infrared on it. As we see, getting a locomotive to slow down was also a challenge. It just didn't like to respond to the speed up and slow down commands being issued by the controller at all. I have to admit, I did kind of like the brakes reel effect, which seemed to work very reliably, despite all the other problems I was having with this engine. Again, it took quite a bit of effort to get this locomotive to behave correctly at all. Well, that's about as much of this as I can probably take, and I'm sure the same thing goes for you folks watching at home. Let's take a look at this locomotive now in DCC operation. Thank you. 
Again, as you can hear by my Digitrax controller in the background, it took quite a few turns to get this engine to start to move, period. Note the fact that the rear headlight does not seem to function. This is interesting considering the instructions and descriptions clearly state that it should have a rear functioning headlight. I do note occasionally that the front headlight comes on when the rear headlight is supposed to. Not sure what's going on here, but again as we saw when I disassembled it, I didn't actually see any evidence of one actually being installed. One thing I have to give and will give MRC credit for is the fact that this locomotive did not stall on any of the switch points, despite the fact that as you've seen in previous videos, if you've seen my RF Shark review, etc., that is very possible. The main reason for this being is that the original MRC decoders had a huge problem with this, as they would stall out at every chance they got. I believe these to be the two capacitors on the bottom of the board that were literally resting on top of the motor, where the board was literally scotch taped down onto. I have to admit, by this point, seeing how well it performed in my yard, I was starting to really warm up to this locomotive, especially considering its stellar performance in my yard, not stalling on the switch points and responding to the commands pretty well. But I will note again, the rear headlight, as you can see, is clearly not working and it hasn't been through the entire test. By this point, despite the minor hiccups and the lack of rear LED, I was so impressed with this locomotive, I was about to think this, look, this review was going to end on a positive note. But then... What? Uh? For some bizarre reason, the locomotive decided it was on strike and wouldn't move anymore, as far as I can tell, because it went completely dead. No sound, no response, nothing. What the heck? I mean, what the heck? I just pressed F8 and now it magically started running again. Uh, 
As I mentioned, pressing F8 on my controller suddenly caused the engine to jump back into life without sound initially, and then it came back on. That motor sounds terrible. And yes, as I have just pointed out, the locomotive was running very rough at this point, the drivetrain making a lot of weird grinding noises. Cringe. Oh, what is that thing? It's terrible. And there we go again. So yes, as I have just pointed out, the local decided start to start die at that very life. same spot for no apparent reason at all, just when completely dead would not so respond to any commands. Function eight. No matter what buttons I pressed. No, it's not doing it this time. Well, this thing is messed up. No sound now. That's nice. Huh, I may have just broken down there. That's not a good sign. After a little finagling, I was able to get the engine to run again, although it wasn't a very happy. I might be going that fast, though. Oh, boy. On the rough camera work, I was not expecting that to happen. Let's do. Let's try that again. This thing really is weird. So there it is back out there and ooh, now it derailed. What's going on here? What the heck? Let's try backing into it again. This thing is really weird. As you can see, this time the locomotive had no trouble making it around, no funny stalls, no weird derailments, just ran nice and smooth. Nice for a change. That's interesting. I don't have this thing sit on anything right now. So I don't know what's going on with this thing, but it's I had it set on I then noticed as I mentioned on um, the actual the audio from this recording that the throttle was actually set on zero and the engine continued to run by itself. I don't remember setting the throttle to zero, but for some strange reason or the Digitrack system couldn't talk to the engine or the engine didn't want to talk to it. And there it goes again. 
And right on cue, the locomotive cut out again for no apparent this reason. This is so strange. She's on the track, so that ain't the problem. This... Yeah, it randomly just cuts out. Why? We'll get better at the end of the alphabet. As for why it's doing this, uh, I guess it's probably better than mine. And it's now just resetting itself like crazy. I would now get a highly unwanted surprise when the engine finally decided to come back to life very suddenly. So I'm throttling up now, nothing is happening. Boy, what a piece of junk. Yeah, it's now it's working. Not that fast. Oh, come on. I didn't ask you to go to full speed. This is how derailments happen. The system's all over the place. Oh, it's just about as much as I can stand to this thing. And so now we come to the point of this review where I have to give you my final thoughts and final opinion. Well, I started this review out not expecting much, considering how prehistoric the drivetrain was. I was initially impressed, but then drastically disappointed. The fact of the matter is, this is an aging locomotive built to a poor quality standard with all the flaws in it, including the massive pilots, a drivetrain that is unrefined and sort of thrown together at the last second, and electronics from a company that was never known to make anything reliable, that appear to have been further aggravated by a terrible installation, and in general just bad all-around workmanship. What we have here is a dead horse that should have been given a mercy killing a long time ago and allowed to rest in peace. Instead, it was drugged back to life, given a very cheaply made wireless control system, as well as a bad decoder and sound system, and expected to really kind of carry the water for a company that was trying desperately to get its products out. Bottom line, no wacky electronic gimmicks can disguise the fact that this locomotive is prehistoric and completely unrefined and in desperate need of being put out to pasture. As for my final words, if you're looking for a cheap locomotive to get started in DCC and sound with wireless control, avoid this thing. As far as I'm concerned, it's not even worth the $100 I paid to get hold of it. There are much better options out there, even for this price point, that'll run a lot better and more reliably than this old junker will. That said, if you're a Tyco man to a collector and or you had one of these back in the day and you have this crazy idea of putting DCC and sound in one of these locomotives, just buy this locomotive and get it over with. But you better be quick, as MRC has now stopped producing model power products and has sold the rights to produce them over to Lionel. At least for the HO scale end of the business. As for anyone else, avoid, avoid, oh, and don't forget to avoid this locomotive. And before I close this video, I'd like to give a quick shout out to HOSeeker.net. Again, if it wasn't for their free archive and literature, I would not have been able to find the information I needed to make this video. And that concludes this video review. If you liked it, please like, feel free to like and subscribe. If you didn't like it, please feel free to thumbs down it. Thank you for watching, and once again, keep the metal side down.